Okay, I think we're live. Hey, hello, everybody. I'm Clay Olson, and I'm here joined with Andrew Bauman. Say hello, Andrew. Hey, glad to be here. Honor. Love the work you guys do. I appreciate that. So, um, okay, so uh, before we get going into this uh, really exciting webinar, a lot of people are excited about this. Uh, we're, uh, this is going to be a talk with Andrew about reclaiming the beautiful realities tainted by pornography. So we're going to kind of explain what that means and dive into the whole gamut. We have a, a little bit of time to talk, but uh, before we dive into that, I just want to remind everybody that uh, this is a live webinar and uh, it will be available for viewing after this event uh, in the archives and you can check that out. But uh, if you're here with us live, we want to know, feel free to ask questions. This is kind of the benefit of attending a live webinar is that we have the expert with us right here and, and, and so you can ask questions and I'll try to keep up with those questions and respond to them or, and have Andrew respond to them. And uh, uh, yeah, feel free to write those and tell us where you're coming from as well. So and we also want to remind everybody that coming up uh, on March 28th, we have another Fortify chat, which is again, um, every month we do a Fortify chat, which is uh, us sitting down, looking through the questions and kind of challenges that our users are dealing with in the community uh, and, and in their lives. And we take those and we uh, and, and we talk about them with you kind of through the lens of the user's solutions. And so you guys come up with the solutions and we talk through those with you. And that's a really uh, been very fruitful, very fun. So tune in on, on the 28th of March for the next Fortify chat. And then coming up on April 11th, we have Grace McG uh, McLaren, who will be talking to us uh, for our next webinar for, with our expert webinar, which is going to be excellent. Check that out on the webinars page. So, okay, I think we are got all that out of the way. Let me introduce you, Andrew. Um, we're excited to have you. Grateful uh, that you would join us here for this uh, Fortify webinar. Uh, to give everyone some context, Andrew is a licensed mental health counselor, and he holds a Master's of Arts in uh, Counseling and Psychology. Is that right? Correct, yeah. And uh, he recently published a book. Do you have one with you? Uh, it's called The Psychology yeah. Show it up here. Oh, there it is. The Psychology is. of Porn. Psychology of Porn, yep. Uh, essays on Pornography, Objectification, and Healing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you have another book coming out soon, uh, later this year. And what is that going to be called? Uh, that book is called Stumbling Towards Wholeness. Mm. Okay, yeah. I love that. I love that. Uh, I can already kind of tell where you're going with that. I like that. Um, Andrew is also faculty at Montana State University and teaches in the graduate addiction program. Um, you, you're, you're married. Uh, you have kids. Got some kids. Yeah, awesome. Got one on one on the way as well. So um, I'm excited, man. I love those kids. They drive me crazy, but I, you know, I, I love them. Yeah, and and I think you told me their names. They're unique names. Like Brave and. Brave and Wilder and Sela, and then we got a River on the way. River on the way. Okay, awesome. So you're a therapist. You're an expert. Let's dive into this and be and to kind of let you take the stage a little bit. And uh, I want to know, and I think our users want to know, what what is your story? How did you get into this? How what brought you to this profession and work? So I'm actually uh, quite new to this conversation. Um, I would say it's maybe about four four years ago. Um, I'm leading, let me, I'll tell you a little story. I'm leading an addiction workshop with a buddy of mine and I'm facilitating questions and somebody raises their hand and they say, you know, some of the fact of, you know, how, how do you know about addiction or how has addiction personally impacted you? And I literally said this out loud. I said, because of my own 13 year addiction to pornography and I scared myself. Mm. I, actually mean to say that um, I didn't I hadn't actually admitted it out loud yet and here I am facilitating a workshop with probably about 30 people um, and I said it out loud and I, I like wanted to try to reach and like grab my words back <laughs> and, and take them back because I was so like it was because of my own shame yeah. my own fear that they would judge me as hard as I would judge myself mm that they would be as cruel to me as I am to myself. Um, and so, you know, as I, I'm standing there, I say this, I'm kind of freaking out internally while I'm trying to keep my composure. And then I look at their faces <clears throat> and instead of contempt, 
instead of disgust, I see a softness in their eyes. I see them leaning forward. And I, it gives me the courage to continue to tell a little bit about my story. Uh, and that was the beginning of me, in a sense, coming out and owning my historic uh, pornography addiction, my historic objectification of women, and, and just starting to own my story for the first time and not let shame keep me silent. Interesting. That's powerful because I think a lot of people have that same fear of like, oh, yeah. how people respond, how people react. And uh, oh. to hear your experience of, of kind of accidentally uh, yeah. exposing yourself, but then having a reaction of 40 different people in this, uh, in this, in this room respond with not only intrigue, but, but, uh, but, you know, uh, compassion almost. Would you just oh. that way? Totally. And what I've, what I've found is that vulnerability is contagious. Mm. Right. And so if I am kind enough and, and courageous enough to share and be vulnerable, it's normally returned because um, people are drawn to our humanity. Right. They're drawn to our vulnerability and, and it's contagious and it catches on. And so we actually think people are going to be as cruel to us as we are to ourselves. But really, that has much more to do with us than it does with them. Hmm, interesting. So you've, you've uh, since that time, and how many years ago was that? Uh, so that was probably about four years ago, and I had already been in private practice about three years at that time. So I was already a therapist. Um, you know, I had previously been a pastor. I, I, I had come out of these communities where I literally still kept silent um, about this issue. And so I felt even because of my position, almost I needed to be per perfect or present this perfection rather than own where I had been. Interesting. So, so you've worked with a lot of people since that time. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, and now, yeah. Now I solely focus, you know, now I solely focus on uh, working with men uh, with compulsive sexual behavior. Interesting. And we know that this is an issue that impacts men and women alike. However, oh. of course, this is something that uh, men uh, historically and still today struggle with uh, on a kind of a, a level on their own. That's, and yeah, it's an epidemic for sure, as you as you well know. So, uh, the, so in your book, in your new book, uh, the psychology of porn, um, I, I or the psychology of pornography, I, there was a, a little section that I wanted to call out and I want to read, and I wanted you to explain this because some people might not fully understand it. You say yeah. that in your book um, to to begin to break the curse that pornography had over my life. I had to come to the place of blessing the struggle I was having. Yet how do I bless something that is so fundamentally wrong? Can you explain that? Can you talk more about that? What do you mean by blessing the struggle that you were dealing with? So on the surface, it feels a little bit confusing, right? Because we would never want to bless pornography because of the actual destruction that it causes. So I'm not talking about actually blessing the act of objectifying a woman or you know, degrading another by no means. What I'm talking about there is what does it mean to begin to bless our story, to bless what's behind the pornography, right? So, so for me, you know, I'm eight years old. My parents split up. Um, nobody's talking about anything. Like there's no talking. We literally go on vacation and we don't come back to my father. Um, so, so nobody's talking about anything. So by the time I begin to grow into adolescence, there is this deep pain and void in my life. Um, and there's this deep silence of anything authentic. And so I begin to search for some comfort. I begin to search for some beauty, something in my life to give me a little bit of comfort and peace because of the tragedy that I was living. And so when I talk about blessing pornography, I'm talking about blessing the journey that mm -hmm. led to pornography. Basically, I'm talking about, you know, uh, instead of me having contempt for what I've done, what does it mean to begin to bless that little boy who was so lonely? Mm. That little boy who was so scared, who didn't know how to, how to open up and share his heart and share his pain. And he found an alternative way to find intimacy, even though it was, it was off and wrong. I missed the mark but it comforted my brokenness. 
it, it in some ways it parented me um, mm-hmm. in ways that my parents couldn't. And so I, I survived. I got I, like it helped me survive. And yet it also nearly killed me. It literally nearly killed me. And so it's that wrestling with um, that idea of like, I've got to, I can't have contempt for myself. I have to begin to have kindness. It doesn't mean I bless all the wrong things I've done. It means to bless my story and begin to have compassion for that broken little boy who needed something to survive. Okay. Yeah. That, that helps the clarification of that phrase. And isn't it, isn't it true that, uh, you know, one of the things that this book also uh, addresses and that you address in your own practice is the fact that like behind the allure of pornography or behind what pornography, you know, is, um, it's really kind of a distorting uh, or, um, you, know, uh, you know, twisting. Yes, uh, something that is actually beautiful or can be very beautiful in the right context, and something you know that we shouldn't be ashamed of our uh, our interest in sex, our our uh, uh, draw towards sex. Uh, right. Those are beautiful things that are, are a part of a, a healthy lifestyle uh, oh. in the right context. But pornography twists and warps it, and, and that's what this book's really all about. Can you talk about that? Yes, yes, totally. So I, I feel a lot. Of- is because we get it wrong so easily. Somehow we try to deny beauty. Mm-hmm. We basically try to act like, so, you know, I see a beautiful woman walking by and I'm just like, oh gosh, oh gosh, you know, and I get all anxious or I, you know, and it's like, our re- it's not, our relationship with beauty is distorted. The beauty itself is not wrong. I'm actually designed for beauty. I was created for beauty. Mm. It's actually how I engage beauty. And so what I mean by that is, you know, I live in Seattle and the few sunny days a year that we have, mm-hmm. Mount Rainier is, is kind of in the backdrop and it's this gorgeous, beautiful mountain that's just glorious, right? And so when I see Mount Rainier comes out, I'm in awe of her beauty, right? There's an honor, there's an awe to her. So how do we begin to engage beauty with awe and honor rather than objectification. So when a woman walks by, am I objectifying her? Am I taking her clothes off in my mind? Am I fantasizing? Am I I degrading her without her permission? Or can I have an awe about her? Can I honor her beauty? Not try to, you know, just deny it, but like, yeah, you know, God made her well, but I'm not going to continue to, to focus and to obsess and to objectify her. I'm going to honor her beauty. Yeah, interesting. And and uh, and desires. I think a lot of people hold a lot of shame with regard to you know I shouldn't feel uh, interested. I shouldn't be attracted, or I shouldn't whatever. And and it is true that pornography represents a very counterfeit, uh, damaging, harmful version of something that is truly, uh, again, beautiful and intended. Exactly. And, exactly. And, and understanding that that distinction. Uh, reckon, I think you put it well, like, you know, honoring that which is beautiful, but, but uh, it's the relationship that is the, the challenge. Totally. totally. And it's so much easier for us just to say bad, you know, right? Or even religious communities that I grew up in, bad. And that's the end of the conversation. But mm. it's because we don't want to be do complex thinking or we don't want to nuance and wrestle with beauty. It's like we got to change our relationship to beauty. Right. And so for, you know, 13 years, I harmed beauty. I tried to devour beauty. Right. I mm. tried to take it captive. Um, OK, that is a wrong. Uh, I am engaging beauty in a negative way. That's not how beauty um, that's that's not how I need to engage beauty. And so for the last decade of stepping into my own healing work and learning how to have healthy relationship with my wife is me not trying to devour beauty but me trying to honor it. Interesting. Interesting. You said there's another part of your book that um, I want to draw a little bit of attention. Well, before we go there, actually, can you give us any examples of, uh, you know, cause that's a different way of thinking about. Yep. It kind of, for some people it could be a, a paradigm shift a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, can you give us yeah. So, so last weekend, that? Yeah, so last weekend we're in uh, Vancouver, a little family vacay, having a blast. All of a sudden, this 
you know, gorgeous woman walks by. Okay. So, you know, I look up and I'm like, wow. And so I say out loud, man, she, she is very attractive. And my wife looks up and says, wow, she really is. Mm -hmm. And we go on our way. That was it. Now let's imagine that I am struggling with a secret sexual addiction and I am with my wife, which again, I see all the time, you know, many the men I work with are hiding. Um, let's say uh, I'm have a secret addiction and I see that beautiful woman walk by and my wife's right there. All of a sudden I begin anxiety in my heart. I feel immense shame. I can't acknowledge the beauty that I saw. Right? I can't tell the truth. I can't acknowledge it to my wife. I have to, in a sense, hide it. So when I begin to hide, that actually begins to bolster my secret compulsive behavior because then I feel so much shame that I need to go, I need to go hide because I thought she was attractive rather than just saying, wow, she's really attractive. It doesn't control me when I'm authentic about it. It doesn't have that power over me because I'm not going to do anything with it. I'm just acknowledging what is true. Right. Does that okay. make sense? It weakens the, 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 you know, the control, the shackles weaken uh, it by acknowledging it and moving on. Yeah. Like, I, don't need to, I don't need to indulge it and I don't need to deny it. So that's an important distinction for your listeners here. We don't need to indulge it. Right. I'm not going to go home and go fantasize or masturbate or I'm not going to indulge that because that would be wrong. Right. But I, I am. And I'm also not going to deny the beauty that's there. Yeah. Because if I deny that it actually begins to have more control over me. So. Um, so I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about your. Um, in your book, you also talk about kind of why you fell into this, like how you got captivated with this. And I think a lot of people can relate to this. So I'm going to read a little excerpt from your book, if that's okay with you. Okay? Yep. Okay. Uh, you say... I like the book. Yeah, I, I hope so. <laughs> um, you say, when you talk about your family, mm -hmm. uh, you say that you, you were devastated by divorce, infidelity, and addiction. My father, absent and silent. My mother, nearly... Uh, nearby, but yet so far away. I longed for any beauty in uh, the desolation of my life. I longed to be touched, to be held, to feel pleasure, and to numb my pain. I tried drugs, I tried alcohol, but nothing quite touched my desire and broken heart like the body of a woman. Yes. You continue and say that the, the false intimacy of pornography stepped into those desires where my parents could not and offered me comfort. In many ways, pornography was a good parent and equally a destructive one. What do yes. you mean by that? Yeah. Um, basically, you know, a little bit of what I touched on earlier. Yeah. Right? Porn was this, was this pacifier. Um, porn, in a sense, a, a body of a woman uh, touched that place in me that was so broken. Yeah, um, it was, it's almost like this. It's almost like the idea of a, of a Band-Aid. Right, a childhood band aid, like one of those. As I grew up with Flintstone band aids, maybe now it would be like Paw Patrol band aids. My kids love those. So imagine a Paw Patrol band aid on a shotgun wound in my chest. All right, so it would slow the bleeding a little bit. Yeah, but it's it's not going to do anything. It's not going to fix the huge gaping hole in my chest. I'm bleeding out, and so this 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 band aid. And then it just almost is like we're putting more and more of these band-aids. Every time I use pornography, it's like putting more and more of these band-aids on this gaping hole. How can we deal with the hole? How do we deal with our deep woundedness, our trauma, our sexual abuse? Um, you know, that's what we got to get to the core of, the pain behind the porn. Um, what, what many times is driving our use. Now, it starts with curiosity, right? For me... Uh, in the more conservative religious culture that I grew up in, no one talked about sex in a healthy way. No one talked about uh, our body in a, in a healthy way. It was always hush, hush. You know, oh, don't talk about, you know, body parts. They're private. You know, don't, nothing. Rather than just a healthy dialogue. Mm -hmm. A healthy dialogue of our bodies. Um, so, so I, in a sense, started out my, my search and then really, it was just curiosity. It was actually, it wasn't, 
It wasn't. It was curious. What what is a woman's That's body? Walks, it is, right. It's curious. Yeah. Totally. Interesting. Totally. I needed to learn, right? In a sense, because nobody was talking about it. My church, my parents, nobody was talking about it. So there was a failure in that arena where then I looked to porn to kind of fill that need. And I, I assume, and I think that's a lot of people's stories as well. So we have to change the, the conversation. What is healthy sexuality? Mm. Right? So, so stop me if I'm boring you with my stories, but oh, please. I, like, I like stories. So we're on our way to our family trip to Goodwill. All right. And my, <clears throat> my kids, my kids, my son is five. My daughter is, is uh, just turned three. And my son all of a sudden says, I, I pee out of my vagina or something ridiculous, right? <laughs> and I'm just like, what? And then my daughter says something ridiculously about her penis. Or and I'm like, oh, geez, like we've got to. But they're already talking about using normal names for body parts, even if they got it all wrong. But like it showed I was actually proud of my wife and I. Like we're talking about our body parts. We're talking about without shame, without, you know, no, like this is how your body works. This is what, you know, this is it. This is, you know, and so we've got to begin to have just a normalcy, you know, and what I'm trying to do, even though I didn't receive that as a kid, what I'm trying to offer my kids is we're going to talk openly about this stuff. We're going to, we're not going to have secrets and hiding. Um, and, and I really think that really is a big part in stopping this with our generation. Yeah. Now, 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 these these concept, concepts we're talking about, this idea of of uh, you know not shaming and, and and you know looking at the the porn journey and blessing it and and recognizing that there's something behind uh, the twisted, warped version that porn is providing that that, that is healthy. Um, you know, someone could 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 hear that mm -hmm. and maybe misunderstand it uh, just a bit and. And, uh, you know, and maybe come to the conclusion that, well, wait a second. So, so what you're saying is that, you know, porn is not so bad because it ultimately it represents something good. Um, and that, uh, you know, maybe, maybe we should be okay with it. Now to everybody yeah. listening, everybody here is kind of on the same page that this is something that they want to get rid of, uh, you know, yes. they want to remove from their lives. They see this is having a harmful impact. You know, right. maybe talk to that a little bit about, uh, you know, how, Yes. How porn, we're still recognizing that this is a challenge and that this is not healthy and good. Yes, no. And so that's where it's like, let's name the beauty is good. Yeah. Objectif objectifying and trying to devour that beauty through pornography is not good. Yes. It, will, it will actually kill you. Uh, and, and it nearly killed me. Uh, and so that's what we're, we're talking about here. The, the act of objectifying, of defacing another, of trying to devour another. Um, it is, it will kill you. Okay. So let's, let's dive into kind of the, the title of this webinar, which is Reclaiming the Beautiful Realities Tainted by Pornography. How yep. do we reclaim? I think we've identified some of those beautiful realities. If we want to dive into that a little bit more, if you want to clarify some of that, what are those beautiful realities? But, but, but let's talk about reclaiming those. How do we do this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we talked about our relationship with beauty our relationship with you know women. So we won't really necessarily dive into that. I think one of the things I really wanted to touch on is beginning to, um, and we touched on a little bit, but reclaiming the beauty of ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. So what we think, when I, when I say that, so many times, and I know I did it for years, we try to abuse ourselves into transformation and healing. If I can beat myself up enough, if I can hate myself enough, maybe I'll somehow, somehow, somehow I'm going to change. Yeah. And that is the opposite of what you need to do because you actually put yourself in a position to soothe more. I actually need to self-soothe. And how have I always self-soothed? I've gone to pornography and masturbation to self-soothe. Mm. So when you are cruel to yourself, you actually end up pushing yourself further into addiction further into these compulsive behaviors and further into hiding. Mm. So how do we begin to reclaim the beauty of our relationship to ourselves? Mm. Uh, that is a huge work in the recovery work that I do, reclaiming how we engage ourselves. So let's dive into that a little bit. Uh, we talked yeah. about kind of this negative self-talk, the beating up, yeah. but what are some maybe tangible examples 
yep. that you can so, an offer of, of, of how to reclaim that relationship. Yeah. So let's let's do this example. I'm gonna <clears throat> play, play with me a little bit here, okay? Uh, so my son last year is learning how to ride his bike. All right. So I'm going to engage in this made up scenario. I'm going to engage him in two different ways. Okay. Number one, I'm going to engage him with content. Number two, I'm going to engage him with kindness. All right. Okay. So this is a made up scenario. Obviously I'm not going to do this to my kid. Yeah. Okay. So number one, learn to ride his bike. He falls over. He starts to cry. All right. Son, stop crying. You little baby. Get up and learn how to ride your bike. Suck it up. You stink at this. You better learn how to ride. Okay? Time out. That's even hard for me to, to do as a, an example. Yeah. Doesn't sound good. No. So if I abuse my son like that, is he going to learn how to ride his bike? No, I mean, not in a, in a well, effective way. I think, yeah, I think he actually, he's, it's a trick question. I, I tricked you. I think he's actually going to learn how to ride his bike, but he's going to learn how to ride scared, mm -hmm. right? Because he's scared of my violence. Because if he messes up, if he falls off, I'm going to abuse him. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now, number two, my son falls off his bike. I walk up to him, he's crying. Oh, buddy, I'm so sorry you fell over. Uh, oh, can I can I hold your bike next time? Can we go over to the grass so if you fall over, um, it doesn't hurt when you fall? Um, is he going to learn to ride his bike if I am engaging him with kindness of a father? Yeah. I really think he. It might actually take him longer, but he's going to learn how to ride free. He's not going to be scared. So I tell you all that. I set up that whole scenario for this reason. In many ways, we all have a young kid inside of ourselves who's learning how to ride, who's learning how to be an adult, who's learning how to do things that we don't know how to do, we're scared to do. How do you engage that little boy or that little girl inside of you? Do you engage him with contempt or her with contempt? Or do you engage him or her with kindness? Because kindness is going to help you learn how to ride free. Kindness is going to help you learn how to ride liberated. If you are cruel to yourself, you may learn how to ride. You may you know, white knuckle it until, you know, oh, I'm 150 days free of porn. But it's like you haven't dealt with anything. You're just literally, you, just, you know, you're trying to white knuckle it and force your way through it. And once that breaks, once once you fall, you're going to fall hard. Exactly. And you, you actually are worse off than when you started. Mm. What does it Everybody, mean? Do you hear that? I, you know, it's one thing to track, you know, victories versus setbacks and try to get up a streak. And that's very important. But if you're not additionally addressing uh, yes. some of these underlying issues in, in your relationship uh, exactly. with this, with beauty, with yourself, and other other things, yep. uh, you're, uh, some challenging times are up ahead. Versus the alternative, where when that does happen, you're going to yep. respond in a, in a healthy way and get back up and, and continue forward. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what how we engage our relationship with ourselves is so important to this journey of recovery. Can I be kind? Not not again, not that I'm not mad that I messed up again, not that but can you be kind to yourself in the in the in the way that um, I was beginning, you know, as I began to heal, I thought back on that little boy who was hurting so bad and I began to grieve. I began to have compassion for what I suffered. And that compassion um, begins to that grief begins to lead to healing because we can't grieve something that we hate, right? So if I hate myself, how am I going to grieve my story? Yeah, y you can't, you know, you can't. I can only fully grieve to the level in which I love. So if I love myself, I can begin to grieve and heal uh, my relationship with pornography and I, I can outgrow it. I, 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 I can mature out of it. I can, I don't need it anymore. Because I'm healing that core shotgun wound. Mm. I love it. So, uh, are there any other ways that uh, that we could talk about for for the users that as far as reclaiming the, the beautiful realities tainted by pornography? Uh, yeah. What about uh, you know the relationship with with a partner, with a spouse, with uh, 
you know, we talked about recognizing beauty uh, mm -hmm. externally, but what about the beauty from within that relationship? Yeah, I would say so many of us, especially those who grew up on porn, we, we have become accustomed with false intimacy. We actually don't know how to relate anymore. Uh, one of the essays that I wrote it was is called a pornographic style of relating uh, in my book. You you learn how to relate to the world pornographically. And so we don't necessarily know how to have authentic intimacy. And so what I would say in, in engaging your partner, what does it begin? What does it mean for you to begin to not engage her porn, or him or her pornographically? But, you know, what, what would it be like for you guys to sit there? And I do this a lot with with uh, my clients, with, with their partners. And you sit there for 10 minutes uninterrupted, you know, a foot away from each other, staring into each other's eyes. Don't say a word. You sit wow. there, here, you know, for 10 minutes or whatever. Yes. Is that me and you can do it right now? That's right. <laughs> our, our intimacy is I can feel it. It's yeah. growing. Right. But But this is just one intimacy exercise that I do because what we're doing is, uh, it, we're looking into each other's eyes. There's, there's no barriers. We're, we're, we're connecting at a deep level. What does it mean sexually, you know, to not just go right into sex, but like enjoy each other, play, be with each other. You know, like you, you get to know each other much more deeply rather than your, your historic use of porn is not about the journey. You know, it's a, just about, you know, a cheap pleasure. And so what I'm talking about is no actually beginning to dive deeply into intimacy and connection, which is much more terrifying, right? Yeah. That's where the risk, that's where, yeah, that's where we're so scared of the risk that we run away back to the false intimacy because it's so much safer. Well, that's interesting because that, that is one thing that porn, pornography does kind of strip out of uh, a, 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 a relationship is, is this kind of very self-focused, selfishly focused uh, pleasure, you know, highlight, just going like, get get me to that finish line, uh, yeah. as opposed to this beautiful, complex, nuanced relationship that that is far more than physical. Uh, yes. Oh and, yeah. Uh, and, and and all the wonders and kind of complexities and 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 uh, unique little a part yeah. of the relationship and it kind of strips of all that. And so reclaiming some of those beauty is that those will start to come back. Exactly. Oh, you come back and you start to recognize and see this person across from you, this partner, whether, you know, it's a, whether you're involved with them, you know, physically and intimately to that level or just a girlfriend, boyfriend, like those details start to kind of manifest themselves in a way that you can start to. Oh, really but but that, that's the, the problem, Clay. We're actually terrified of goodness. I'm actually terrified of authentic intimacy because it's going to expose me. Mm. Mm. And so how do we, how do we, because I don't want to be exposed as a fraud and yet I kind of know that I am. And so we actually run away from authentic intimacy because we're so scared of it. We want surface intimacy. Yeah, totally. We want, you know, and, and that's where uh, in, in my book coming out, uh, I have a whole chapter on uh, our wrestling with goodness. Yeah. Right. How do we begin to wrestle with goodness? Because goodness is is terrifying, right? There's so one example. There's the nicest restaurant in Seattle. If you're ever out here, we gotta go. But it's like hundred something bucks a plate, right? You so it's right. It. Continue. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I can never can afford to go there. <laughs> so I go and I, you know, I'll go to the bar and I'll get some, you know, fries or something. But like they have these truffle fries, amazing. Anyways, so if I go, if I ever have a steak there, that steak is going to ruin every other meal for the rest of my week, right? Because it's the greatest, the greatest steak I've ever had. Okay. But I can't afford to have the greatest steak. I actually can only afford Burger Master down the street, uh, which is this kind of cheap yeah. drive up place, right? So basically, the idea is I can't afford the good, the good stuff. And the good stuff actually ruins what I can't afford. So I actually then prefer the cheap, you know, crappy stuff. That's interesting. Um, and, and so there's this idea of like, goodness is so scary. Genuine intimacy with my wife is terrifying. And so do I settle for the cheap imposter of pornography rather than actually going to the banquet and feasting with my vulnerability and my heart wide open? I like that. Um, 
we have a question I want to get to, if you don't mind. Go for one it. of our users it says, as a married couple who both struggle with pornography, what are some uh, other intimacy exercises that you suggest uh, to your married clients? Yeah, great. So, great. Yeah. You know, great idea. And, um, you know, w one thing, and I don't want to go with any graphic detail or anything, um, as it might not be good for some folks, but beginning to pray over each other's bodies, you know, beginning to be with each other's bodies, um, telling the story of, of body parts, right? Our body parts hold shame. So what does it mean to, in those moments with your partner, to tell the story of whatever it is, your breasts, you know, your, your legs, your, what holds trauma? What holds, you know, I've got, um, uh, one crazy story of shame that happened in high school around my genitals, you know, and it's like, what does it mean for me to begin to engage that story with my partner and share because our body holds shame. And so that's how intimacy and vulnerability are really fostered beginning to enter each other's bodies and our stories of our bodies. So that would be one thing that I'd really encourage you guys to do as a couple, because that's going to really be, once you taste genuine intimacy with your partner, it's actually kind of hard to go back to the fake stuff, right? Because, you know, it's an, if I take a, a bite of that crappy cheeseburger versus taking a bite of the steak, I'm going to want the steak. Uh, I want the, but we don't know the taste of real intimacy. Uh, interesting. It's like you've never had, you don't know what you yeah. don't know. For many people, they don't know they yeah. don't know. So I, I'll just take the cheap, oh. the cheap imitation. Yeah, which is killing you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, interesting. Um, what are the What are the things you want to talk about from your book? I, there's so many good things that you you reference uh, the book. Uh, I, I want to give you time to be able to maybe touch on a few points that you think would be helpful to anybody in this struggle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, the the main parts, you know, we definitely touched on. Let me. I'm just gonna do a little another shout out here. Uh, here you go. Yeah, basically this book kind of came about um, this year, kind of on accident. I just started really just writing, um, you know, I ended up writing 16 different essays on pornography because I was trying to look for resources for my clients. You know, I was basically just trying to, uh, you know, look look for resources and having a, a hard time that wasn't all based on just kind of behavior changes and behavior modifications, but really just like some deeper engagement around pornography. Um, so yeah. yeah. So one of the one of the um, one of the things that I, I have in my book is a is an entire wedding ceremony to pornography. Um, so basically, it's a, a wedding vows, um, and so it's a little bit <clears throat> interesting. But when I when I lead people through this exercise, you know, for for them to literally say, uh, I'll just read a little part of it right now. Uh, I porn. I Andrew take you porn to be my wife. And there's a whole uh, a whole marriage ceremony to pornography. And when I say that out loud or when I get a client to put their own name in there and say it out loud, it I feel it differently, right? And so the idea that porn is not just thing we get over, it's actually a relationship that we got to mourn, that we have to mourn its loss because porn was such a comfort to me. And so even at uh, months of sobriety, I would always have it in my back pocket just in case stuff got really hard, right? I'd almost keep it. It's a relationship. It's a relationship, and we got to let it go. Um, so there's actually yeah. – so, Almost like you need to divorce yeah. it. So, that, so we first yeah. do the marriage ceremony, and then the next part is disavowing your marriage to pornography. So we walk through a whole thing, um, and I'll just read this part. In the name of God, I, Andrew, give myself permission to leave you, porn. I want to first thank you for being there for me when others were not, holding me for better or for worse, rich or poor, sickness and health, loving me. But now I must leave because I am dying with you in my life. I must break my pledge to you. I must choose a non-addictive life and grow apart from you. I will miss you, but I will no longer choose you. I bless you, but now I must say goodbye. I now release myself from my commitment to pornography. And so basically the idea of we have to look at this like a relationship, like a commitment. And you might have to grieve it. Even though you hate it, you still love it. That's why you continue to go back to it. Yeah, but it's kind of a false sense of, of oh, love. Totally. Oh, it's completely yeah. false. But we're so committed to it, right? We're so intertwined yeah. with it. 
it's actually the longest relationship many of us have had. Yeah. So th there's some some comments that have been coming up yeah. on the uh, in, in the show that I want to maybe draw attention yeah, to. So uh, people are kind of coming back to some earlier uh, uh, some of the earlier discussion that we had around acknowledging yep. beauty um, and, and recognizing yep. beauty. And uh, someone mentioned that I'm not sure my wife would appreciate it if I openly verbalized an acknowledgement of beauty and someone passing by. Can you uh, can you say more about the difference between indulging? A passing attraction or an urge versus uh, acknowledging yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, um, So, you know, again, I don't know if you're where obviously your wife is, if, if depending on how healthy or not healthy she is as far as her own insecurity, right? Uh, I know my wife has done enough emotional work and healing work and trusts me enough where she's not threatened, you know, by if I acknowledge beauty. But you might be at that totally. place. Totally. And, and Somebody may be more in the thick of it, uh, where that could be really triggering for their spouse. That so maybe difficult. that's not the best place to acknowledge it with your wife in that moment. You know, but are you at least having the conversations about it, about beauty, about you know, hey, here's where I'm at. It, when it, when I acknowledge beauty, I feel I feel scared to acknowledge it because uh, I'm afraid it's going to trigger you. Like, let's at least be having these conversations about this to try to be more honest with ourselves and try to be more open and authentic. Because that's one of the biggest things that I stress. What does it mean to live in truth and begin to be authentic with ourselves? And that's including, you know, beauty, including, we, we got to be authentic because addiction, um, you know, pornography is about hiding. And so what does it mean to no longer hide? And that means I'm going to show my warts and I'm going to be more real, but, it, you know, at least I'm authentic. Yeah. And there's a power yeah, in that authenticity. Totally, because it's much harder for me to go hide into secret sexual behavior when I'm authentic, when I'm real with my yeah. struggles, when I'm real with my feelings. I no longer need to escape them. No, 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 no. Um, um, are in a position, are in a position you know, where they're having difficulty opening up to anybody yeah. about this. They haven't yet opened up to a spouse, a partner, a parent, you know, uh, or you know, religious leader, if they're religious, they uh, definitely not a therapist. Like they're literally containing this and they come in to fortify um, or any other experience uh, to, to get help. And, and they, yeah, and then they get and you support and community and maybe that's a good stepping stone. That's the first step. But they're really recognizing as we rehash and rehash the importance of, of opening up to somebody that you trust, being authentic, being vulnerable, and the power that comes with that. But but to somebody that's not yet there, that it's just kind of like, oh, I don't even know, what would you say to that individual? What, how, how would you uh, how would you describe that importance or, or, or encourage them to get to a place where that is a So one of the things that I like to talk about is, let's count the cost, okay? So what's your fear of being authentic? What are you going to lose? You might lose stuff. You might lose some, you know, relationships. You might lose some respect of the community. You might lose some stuff by being authentic. And that's why it's so scary. But now let's count the cost if you're not authentic, if you're not real. And we got to weigh those out. So, for example, um, I'm working with this gentleman a few years back. He's probably in his mid-50s, okay? Uh, is having a lot of unwanted sexual behaviors, you know, pornography, all these things. He, we begin to dive into what does it mean for you to be more authentic for you? And it comes out that he has had an affair with his, uh, his wife, but it was 15 years prior. So as we begin to push into this, push into this fact, I encourage him, what does it mean to begin to be honest with his, with his wife? And he says, well, we're just starting to have like, a, like a better marriage. We're just starting. And he was terrified to reveal. The truth. And mm -hmm. so what we had to look at is, okay, what is the, what is the cost if you don't tell her? And that's where I'd say that cost is actually greater if he doesn't tell her because his marriage will surely die because the intimacy is broken because there's not authentic, there's not authentic engagement there. He's hiding a part of his truth, of his reality. And so the cost is that his marriage will sure die. It might be a slow death, but tells her yeah. it still might die. It might die, but he also might save it. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the risks, uh, outweigh, uh, you know, the benefits outweigh the risks. So I would tell yes. that to your users. What is it? And you gotta, pra- you gotta begin to practice authenticity with safe people. And a lot of people don't have safe communities. And so I would say, okay, don't like, then don't share if they're going to shame you, if they're going to harm you. But what does it mean to begin to seek out safer communities? You know, uh, SA or SLA, you know, these different communities where you can begin to talk openly about your struggles. Um, you know, communities like this, but but even in you know, not just an online platform, in your real life, you got to begin to open that, open your life up. And it's terrifying. Again, I don't, it's so terrifying, but it's so worth it. It's so worth it. And, and uh, it's, oh free. my gosh, the liberation is unbelievable. Right. Because it's just like, I don't have to hide anymore. I can be the same guy with my clients that I can with my wife, that I can in my church community, that I can in like, I can be the same guy rather than I remember in being addicted. I would almost have to like hide and change. And depending on what scenario I was in, I have to become someone else. And I was exhausted. Yeah. Um, uh, another question came uh, from one of the users uh, that's watching us live right now. Uh, and said, uh, I'm going to paraphrase it because it's lower down, uh, but it uh, says that, um, um, you know, referencing the fact that you grew up in a conservative community, a religious community growing up, and, and they say, well, I don't know if you're still religious or not, but regardless, uh, uh, how do you think uh, religious communities and or churches should respond or should be dealing with this? Mm, issue? Great question. Great question. Um, you know, one of the things, and I address it in my book as well, about church leaders and how do we begin to just be more open, and it, similar with parents, right? How do we begin to be more open with it? And, and you probably see this every day in your work. Like people aren't, church communities are scared to talk about this issue. I think all, yeah. most communities and, and oh. most still yep. church You're, you're right. Oh, yeah. uh, just scared to talk about it. Well, if it's truly impacting, you know, some research says up to 70%, you know, of men and uh, a super high percentage of women, like, it's just, it's a silent killer. Like, we got to start having more courage around these conversations. Um, and a lot of times it's because of maybe their own shame, uh, you know, either spe- specifically religious leaders, um, you know, and we're at my faith tradition, a more conservative evangelical. Um, some of the research says up to 50% of evangelical pastors use regularly. Well, they're not going to talk about porn if they're using porn. They're actually going to push it away, right? So we have to begin to, and part of my work is pushing leaders into being more authentic themselves and leading out of that place so they can help lead more, you know, authentic lives. Thank you for that. I want to get to another question real quick. Um, It says, do you have any advice on how to handle a setback after a long period of sobriety? Yeah. Uh, and, and he continues to say, yesterday I gave up eight months mm. and last four hours have been a nightmare. Mm. That's, ch- that's pretty tough after eight yeah. months. All the progress I was making and the beauty that I was starting to uh, awake to seems like a fantasy no. now. I can also relate to the idea that this is a life and death issue yeah. for me. Looking for advice on how to begin yeah. again. So what, what would you say to that individual? This, this, is, where, this is, is where I push life. into some of the categories – Instead of having contempt for yourself, what does it mean to beginning to grieve that? Because as I hear that, that makes me sad. Like my heart, it just feels that. Like I am broken for that person. Yeah. Will, will they let themselves be broken for themselves? Instead of having contempt, instead of beating themselves up, will they mourn? Will you allow yourself to have the courage to mourn that? Because that's heartbreaking. Whatever led you to this, whatever you know, this, this relapse, how do you grieve it? How do you begin to grieve it? Cause that, yeah, yeah, just grieve it. It's sad, but it also, you know, this is where in perspective, you know, if we look at, okay, your use in the last year. So let's take this, this person, for example, um, you know, eight months of clean, clean, cleanliness, four months of use. Let's say they used, you know, once a week, four months. My math is, I'm a terrible mathematician. What is that? Once a week, four months, four times. I don't know. I'm not. Anyway, I'm basically trying. How much do they use once a week? Okay. So 
They use once a week for four months. All right. So what is that? 16 times? Somebody help me with my math here. Terrible. Anyway, they use yeah. a lot, right? But not tons. So let's say they use 20 times. Okay. But the year yeah. prior, they use once a week for the whole year. Right. So 52 times, 52 weeks a year. Right. So if we just look at the last two years in this person's life, they used 16 times this past year. They used 52 last year. They're getting better. Like they're, they're getting healthier. Let's keep a perspective. Even if you relapse, let's look at your year prior. Like, did you objectify women less? Yes. Okay. Like, I don't need to go back and I'm not going back to the beginning. You're not going back to the beginning of I have to start all this over. It's not about the, the, the checks you check off. It's about am I learning to engage, you know, beauty, learning not to objectify? Am I learning how to honor? That's the point. It's not. Well, and I think, I think, you know, one thing that we always talk about and it's so true is that this is a, this is a process. Yeah. Recovery. The journey, and it doesn't. It's not a, an on-off switch right. where, hey, I'm, I'm jumping into this. I'm starting to see a therapist. I'm I'm joining for whatever, and all of a sudden, yep. pop! I am now going to be clean from this day forth. Uh, although you know we've seen that happen, and we hope that, that can happen for people. The reality is, uh, and reality oftentimes is a lot yes. messier, and it time and process. And so, uh, eight months clean. Uh, my guess for that individual that that is um, probably perhaps their, one of their longest streaks. That's, a, that's an enormous, an achievement. Well exactly. done. Uh, you should celebrate uh, that that uh, achievement. And, you know, although, you know, you had a setback, again, recognizing that as a part of the overall journey, as you're kind of talking about last year, this year, like this journey is long and uh, it's a marathon and, uh, there will be uh, setbacks, challenges, you know, uh, moments of, of weakness. Yes. And, uh, and it's understanding how to relate to those moments, understanding how to get stronger, under, understanding how to respond to the moments of setbacks to, so where yes. you can actually uh, get back yes. up, not be in a slump of depression for the next week or binge saying, well, heck, if, I, if I've lost it, well, might, might as go well. All, go all out, right. Recognizing these things, you know, step back from the, the reality, dissect it a little bit, and, and find out where you can kind of improve and what led yes. to this so you can go to the time and just get back on that yeah. horse. And so can you have a curiosity about your relapse, right? What was I, what was I feeling at the time? What was, what was going on for me? Did I just have an argument with my spouse? Did I just have this? What, like, what can I begin to be curious? Um, so much of compulsive sexual behavior is ritualized, right? So what, what is your ritual? What were you doing? You know, well, last night it was, you know, 10 o'clock and, you know, my spouse fell asleep and my phone is always in the bathroom. And then that's when I get aroused. Oh, okay. How are you going to begin to sabotage your rituals? of relapse. And I truly think relapse is a part of recovery um, because how do you engage the relapse is such an important piece in the clients that I work with. How do you begin to engage the relapse, you know, with that kindness, with that grief that we talked about? Yeah. Well, this is, this has been really uh, awesome to talk with you, Andrew. Thank you so much for taking the time. Is there any last um, thoughts or, or you know, comments you want yeah, to make? Yeah, I would just encourage, you know, your listeners, a couple things, you know, buy the book, dive in to it. Um, that would be available on Amazon. Available on Amazon, The Psychology of Porn. Um, also, like, we need you all to be a part of this conversation to begin to, there's, there's not that much out there. You know, again, I'm newer to this conversation. And as I was trying to dive into material, like, we need your voice. We need your authentic life to step forward, to come out of the closet and to, to tell your story, to, to engage this conversation, because this is uh, there's so many people suffering. Uh, and, you know, similar to Clay, other folks who are stepping into this conversation and, and talking about this regular. We need you as a part of us uh, to link arms with us uh, to I truly think to fight evil. Um, and fight for good. Awesome. 
Thank you so much. There's some other comments that we're going to try to get to. Uh, and we'll just kind of uh, get to in text. Uh, so again, thank you, Andrew. Yep. For everybody else watching us live, tune in uh, the 28th of March for our next Fortify chat. And then April, was it 11th? Uh, for our next webinar uh, with an expert. And so, uh, Andrew, yeah. thank you so oh, much. Honored to be with you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.